Today for lecture, we'll talk about the cell membrane and membrane transport. Cell membrane is first. Make sure I got the back pants. Cell membrane or plasma membrane implies it's not a stiff structure. In fact, it's very fluid. We still teach it as the fluid mosaic model. as a membrane that divides the intracellular fluid and the extracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid is also called the interstitium. So think of these as just two fluid compartments. I'll describe it as a membrane that separates two fluid compartments. The ECF and the ICF. picture of it. It's a fancy artwork there and um, what I would um, study are all the things that it's composed of and stuck in it and stuck on it. And so uh, first you have the membrane lipids that comprise the cell membrane. Primarily a, a phospholipid bilayer. That's the basic structure of this. Primarily a phospholipid bilayer with a hydrophobic zone. Point to it, uh, we talked about it last time. Where those fatty acid tails um, face each other is very hydrophobic. And nonpolar molecules could pass through, but polarized ions and the like cannot. Uh, that's what we said the last time about lipids, when I taught about lipids. You also have um, cholesterol molecules stuck in there. Now the presence of cholesterol, if it's there, it helps them um, stabilize the membrane a little better. And, that, and that's better for a platform for uh, protein receptors. Stabilize the cell membrane. Or receptors. For the membrane proteins, all the purple structures they have there, let me list those. Now most of them shown here are, well I wouldn't say most, but some of them act as um, transport proteins like this molecule here. That's primarily what we're talking about today. 
and for transport purposes. And we'll look at a bunch of different ones today. The reason why you need those is um, ions that can't get past the hydrophobic zone usually can pass through um, a protein that has a pore in it. Ions and polar molecules that can't pass through the hydrophobic zone Protein transporters need, require. The other major category besides transport is for cell signaling. That's another main reason why you need uh, proteins in the cell membrane. proteins as peripheral or transmembrane. So if you ever see those terms, quote unquote peripheral, that word means the, the protein is it's either stuck on the inside or stuck on the outside somehow. Um, in or out of cell. Membrane. It's directly or directly. I like, for example, yeah, this one hanging around. Maybe it's a G protein. They, they, they really don't tell you what it is, but the, the idea is you do have these proteins kind of stuck in or stuck out there. So once that go all the way through, or you just refer to it as transmembrane. Transmembrane proteins. <laughs> They span the width of the phospholipid bilayer. They go all the way through. Span the width of cell membrane. The membrane carbohydrates in green they kind of pepper the top of it. Um, they have different functions as well. The terms are glycoprotein or glycolipids. Um, I'm going to give you this term to know, the glycocalyx. All of these carbs that kind of, um, it looks like kind of like a random mess. But the glycocalyx actually functions as a cell identifier. Let me write that on the board. functions as a uh, identifier of self, quote unquote. So your immune system identifies you as you, it doesn't attack you. If it did, it would be an autoimmune response. So it helps your immune system distinguish, to distinguish self from non-self cells. All right, so, so that's the basic idea of this um, cell membrane. Now, the thing about cells is when we start talking about tissues, you'll see that 
cell-to-cell -cell interactions um, can be very important. I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll crop up every now and again, especially when you talk about epithelial tissue and muscle tissue. They're really important. So in this figure, they're showing you three different kinds of cell-to-cell uh, -cell interactions, cell junctions, as they're called. So three different kinds, kinds of cell junctions. <clears throat> Very important for epithelial and muscle tissue when we talk about those. Now, epithelial muscle tissue are two of the four tissue types. That that is epithelial tissue. These cells that are. Um, tightly together, they form linings of different things. Well, anyways, on the bottom there, they, they kind of emphasize the three different kinds. Um, the one on the left, those are um, the tight junctions. It's like a, the, the proteins interlock the cell membranes together. That's what they're illustrating there, and this right here. Making a very tight junction so things don't seep past it in between cells. Tight junctions. Proteins tightly, right, hence the word, tight junctions, interlock cell membranes of neighboring cells. A uh, good example, um, kidney cells. Pretend this is kidney cells and you have these cells lining these epithelial tubes and um, if you want to absorb something through the cell, you have to do it through the cell stuff will just leak through in between cells. That makes for a very effective lining that you can control things uh, through a transcellular route and things don't just leak between cells. That would not be a very good lining. A lining that leaks is not very functional. So, um, tight junctions. Prevent. molecules from linking in between cells. Um, the other two, you kind of see those in cardiac muscle, desmosomes and the, ga and the, uh, the gap junctions. Well, so let me um, draw the desmosomes there. Those desmosomes, They call them these dense plaques with these interlocking proteins. So what they're showing you there is this nice little platform. Here's the cell membrane. Maybe it's a lipid bilayer of two different cells. And, um, I'm trying to draw like these dense protein plaques there. And those plaques have these interlocking proteins. Too many of them, but uh, 
to get the idea across. That really like staples the cells together. These interlocking proteins are similar to the ones in the tight junctions. And so what they do is it's, I said staple, that's a pretty good analogy. Staples cells together. I've also um, heard they're like a glue. People know what staples and glue are. These interlocking proteins help keep these two cells together. But also, as you can see in the picture above, emanating off of those dense plaques are these fi uh, fibers, okay? Um, your intermediate filaments like keratin. What I'm trying to get across is that these intermediate filaments like, for example, keratin, which is a category uh, within the category of intermediate size, they function as part of the cytoskeleton to give the cell structure, in addition to stapling to the cell next to it. So, I'll put cytoskeleton in, in parentheses. I already defined cy cytoskeleton in the last lecture. But anyways, that whole thing, the plaque, the interlocking proteins, and the keratin, that, that is a desmosome, a nice little a staple, stapling mechanism for cell-to-cell -cell adhesion. The last one, the interlocking proteins actually have a pore through them. Those are called the gap junctions. These proteins here, these connexon proteins, have a pore through it. So ions and molecules can flow from cell to cell. So that's a gap junction. Connexon proteins that lock cells together <clears throat> have a pore in it or a channel. cell-cell communication. Uh, the best example of a tissue you'll study that has both the desmosomes and the gap junctions together is a structure called the intercalated disc, and you find it in cardiac muscle. So I'll give you that, give you that as an example to look up. Disc. Those discs of the cardiac muscle found in cardiac muscle contain both desmosomes and the gap junctions. Uh, let me give you a page number to look that up. 
a nice picture here. Cardio book, chapter 18. Uh, page 684. You'll get a picture of that. Yeah, 684. Well, that's a good example of those. Well, I want to move away from the cell to cell um, interactions and start talking about how membrane transport works. And first, let's realize um, travel of a molecule between two fluid compartment is the ECF and the ICF, it's still following the basic rules of diffusion. And classically, diffusion is based on this mathematical equation called fixed law. We won't learn that here. But what you can learn from this picture, it makes common sense that if you have purple tablet in some solution like water, and over time it will dissolve and equilibrate in this purple solution here. So the rate of the diffusion from the purple tablet depends on a few factors. Let's start to talk about diffusion and membrane transport. Diffusion rate affected by a few factors. Um, the concentration of the molecules that are diffusing. <coughs> Uh, the rule is, well, if it's a higher concentration, it should have a higher rate of diffusion, okay? So you need the moment from high concentration low concentration? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And a higher concentration will increase the diffusion rate to lower. So higher will lead to, uh, I'll just say it'll, I don't know, that it'll increase the diffusion rate, I'll say that. There are other things that will increase the diffusion rate, like, uh, well, the size of the molecule. Uh, smaller molecules should diffuse faster than larger ones. That's the general rule. So size of molecule. It, it will go, um, so the rule is, I'll put smaller. A smaller molecule should diffuse faster. Um, also, the temperature of the solution it's in. A uh, hotter, higher temperature should increase the diffusion rate. Solution temperature. Solution temp. So increase temp, that, that should increase the rate of diffusion. So, uh, conceptually, I mean, those are the basic things. Now, when we talk about membrane transport, let me show you a picture of what I'm talking about. The red molecules are diffusing from one side to the other. So the cell membrane is, is, a, diff is a diffusion barrier, right? Cell membrane is a diffusion barrier. So what you see there is um, the plasma membrane is a barrier to molecules that need to diffuse into the cell. Some molecules can can pass freely right through the lipid bilayer. They would call that simple diffusion. But some molecules they they quote unquote need help. Like for example, this red molecule it needs some protein carrier to get it through. So its diffusion must be facilitated, and that's called facilitated diffusion as opposed to simple diffusion.
So let's talk about that a little more. This figure in the book that defines these different kinds of diffusions across the lipid bilayer. Let's we'll start from the left. Here is a lipid. Lipids, um, the rule is like dissolves like. So a lipid can pass freely through the hydrophobic zone right into the cell. And so that's called simple diffusion where you don't require some kind of membrane transport. Example of lipids, we talked about them, steroid hormones. I'll say they freely pass through um, the cell membrane. They just, just flow down their concentration gradient from high to low. Freely pass through. cell membrane down concentration gradient okay again that's from a higher concentration to a lower concentration so on the picture if you're diffusing into the cell there must be a lower concentration inside the cell. Okay. And, well, sometimes you can transport in the opposite direction. That was shown on the previous picture, just to go back one slide. If you wanted to pump the, the red molecule out against the concentration gradient, it would require ATP or energy to do it. And we won't talk about that today, too. But diffusion does not require ATP or energy if you're going down the gradient from high to low. Now, if you're, um, again, a molecule that can't make it past the hydrophobic zone, if you're a polar molecule, if you carry a full charge, and then you can't get through the hydrophobic zone, you require a protein transporter. And so they call this carrier-mediated facilitated diffusion. Um, let's call that... facilitated diffusion, the molecule's diffusion must be facilitated by a protein transporter. Molecules diffusion must be quote unquote helped, facilitated. made out of proteins. I'll put protein in parentheses to remind you. Now the proteins, um, those two pictures in the middle, it could either be a carrier that changes shape. the second one. It says here the binding of the substrate, uh, the green molecule, it causes the transport protein to change shape. As soon as the bind, it changes, so it's allowed entry when it changes shape to the inside. This one, channel mediated through a, a channel protein, most I, mostly ions of selected based on size and charge. Okay. So if it fits through there and it has the right charge, it can go right through. This, these are usually lined with water and you just, it allows nice facilitation. And the difference is, it's always open. 
Okay, it's not changing shape. Just always a pore that's always open. I'll write that down here. A pore that's always open. Sometimes you have pores that are specifically uh, for water. That's over here. Okay, but again, it depends on the pore size, right? So that's an important point to know. It's not just that it's always open. That pore is selecting based on, I'm writing size and charge of the molecule. If it's too big and can't fit through the pore, it'll be, it won't go through. If it's the wrong charge, if it's negatively charged inside the pore and you're positively charged, you'll probably pass through. Okay, but like charges would repel. If it's an open pore that's for water, uh, the diffusion of water is referred to as osmosis. We'll talk about that a lot today. Basically, us move. That's very important for cells. Uh, we'll get back to that. Now, let's talk about that first picture we looked at so I can define passive and active transport uh, shown here in that same picture where the molecules diffusing with the gradient or against the gradient. If it's just down the regular concentration gradient of diffusion, they call that passively if it's transport across the cell membrane. No ATP needed, they're just flowing down the concentration gradient. Or no so if it's passively, I'll just put no ATP. You don't have to expend energy to pump something against the screen. Now, sometimes you do want to do that as actively, passive or active. ATP required to pump. I'm going to put pump in quotes. Usually when I see pump in biology books, it, it implies active transport. It implies ATP is being utilized to pump against the gradient. ATP required to pump molecules against their concentration gradients, against the gradient. So that will be from, instead of high to low, it will be get it from a lower area to an area of higher concentration. So that's against the grain. And, well, there, there's different kinds of active transports that we see in cells. And as a category, the biggest category of active transport is vesicular transport, where you're moving uh, liquids or substances in bulk. So vesicular transport is active transport. <coughs> transport moving items in bulk a lot of it okay, it's active transport Vesicular means a vesicle. A vesicle is a nice little bubble container that the cell makes out of the cell membrane. So think <coughs> vesicle. 
We can just bring in a lot or export a lot. And um, nice pictures of it in your book. There's endocytosis, exocytosis. We'll, we'll look at pictures of each. And in this overview, if you look at the top, um, let me point to it. The red molecules were being brought in here in large quantities. The cell membrane is deforming. And it helps to have this protein code. It may be specific for that red molecule. That's the vesicle right there. So when we say vesicular transport, that's it. You're bringing this large quantity of molecules. You may want to recycle those um, proteins to form another vesicle later. So the uncoated vesicle, depending on what you want it to do with it, if you wanted to destroy it, you'd fuse it with a lysosome. Or if you wanted to somehow um, excrete it, you could transport that vesicle for exocytosis. So to bring it into the cell, endocytosis. Bring into cell, that's easy enough to understand. It may be protein coated, okay, and it, sometimes it isn't. Vesicle may be protein coated. Also, um, what you do with it may be different. You may want to destroy what you brought in. You may want to exocytose what you brought in. Um, so I'll say this endocytosis, I'll say may result in a couple of things. Okay, one, fusion with lysosome. Okay, whenever you do that, the cells are trying to de destroy it. Lice destroy or exocytosis. Okay. I'll just put eject out of cell. It's easy enough to understand. Exo, get it out. Now, the pictures um, that follow are, are close up pictures. There, there's a phagocytosis. That's a term that's sometimes used. Um, it's meant to mean, it's a form of endocytosis that means cell eating. Okay. Where's that on the board here? The best example you, you'll see time and time again, whenever we talk about the macrophage, these, these little scavengers that eat all the non-cell things and keep your body parts, internal organs, sterile. Accomplished by macrophage. You know, they're the best at phagocytosis. They have this very important, these receptors. In the macrophage, they're called the scavenger receptor. They just scavenge for anything that's non-cell. They eat it and get rid of it for you. Scav scavenger receptor. It has an ability to recognize anything that's non-self. Recognizes anything non-self. Right, this one is penocytosis. Um, we just call it cell drinking. You're bringing in water molecules into the cell, which is desirable from time to time. So penocytosis, cell drinking. This is a receptor-mediated endocytosis, much like phagocytosis, 
Um, but this is always like self-defense mechanism. This may not be. You may not want to destroy those green molecules you're bringing in. And so receptor mediated endocytosis. The vesicle is lined with receptors specific for um, the ligand, the specific substance you're trying to bring into the cell. Specific for a particular wanted molecule. All right, so all, those are all the varieties of the testicular transport that are what we call active transport. Then there's other categories of active transport that are important to physiology. There's primary, there's secondary, active transport. Okay, so that's the next topic. So this is not moving in bulk, but this is helping the cell operate for other functions. So we'll move away from the singular transport. transport is different. This is primary, primary active transport. Okay, we'll talk about that one first. Primary and active, they mean a couple of things. Um, we know what active means. It requires ATP because you're moving things against the concentration gradient. Well, if you compare primary and secondary, I mean, one is dependent on the other. Molecules that do the primary active transport, those are dependent upon for the secondary active transport. So let's talk about the primary one first. And this example comes up a few times in this class and in 431. The primary active transport you want to learn about is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. And they show you a series of steps on how it operates. Sodium, potassium, ATPase pump. So I said that when you see the word pump, that usually means active transport. By what it's called, you know what it transports. It transports sodium and potassium against their gradients. And ACE means enzyme. This is an enzyme associated with the protein molecule that breaks down uh, ATP. So you can kind of like get that energy. So ATP, think of it as an adenosine triphosphate. I'll just put like three Ps, right, for ATP. And usually you cleave off the last P. When you cleave, um, when you break chemical bonds, the energy is released. That's what you got to know. So there's energy stored in the bonds. But if you break the bonds with that <coughs> enzyme, you release the energy to do the work. So if you do that, break that last one off, you're left with ADP plus one little PI, which is inorganic phosphate. And you've released the energy in the process and the work gets accomplished. Yeah. That's kind of what we're going with here. So let's say you have this sodium potassium ATP ACE pump. Let me find a pen that works here. Let's say it's this molecule right here, and it's embedded in your lipid bilayer. <laughs> 
Uh, I don't have um, yellow and green. I have green. I can use green for potassium. I just have to use a different color for uh, sodium. What they show you is um, there's three locations where you can kind of load up the sodium. And what you're doing is it's higher out here. It's lower in here. Okay, and you obviously see the ATP binding site there. So how about I use red for sodium? Here's sodium. You know, it's a higher concentration outside uh, than inside the cell. And. Um, we can use a different color for potassium. But anyways, this, this shows you it loading up. It's completely loaded. And when it completely loads, the binding of the sodium, it promotes the phosphorylation of the protein um, by ATP. So that P is what I drew on the board here. This is what's happening there. So you're breaking down the ATP to ADP and the P loads in that location right there. And that provides the energy for um, the next step. You release the phosphorylation causes the protein to change shape, expelling the sodium to the outside. So basically, you take these three sodium molecules and you pump them out against their gradient. It took, um, it took work to do it, so we should probably indicate that on our picture. You had ATP, you know, and you, and you broke it down into ADP plus PI, right? That, that PI is what helped you push it out. In exchange for that, let's start to talk about the potassium. The potassium, the, the gradient is um, well, basically the opposite. You have more potassium um, inside the cell. Cells are more permeable than potassium there, so. <coughs> potassium. More on the inside, there's not as much on the outside. Okay. What you see in this picture is you're loading up the potassium on the transporter. So now it's all loaded. And once it's loaded, again, the protein transporter will, will change its shape in a way so that it can be released to the inside of the cell against its concentration gradient. Okay. And that's when you kind of liberate uh, the inorganic phosphate from that space. I'm just going to simply transport these two molecules into the cell against their concentration gradient. So you've exchanged against their concentration gradients three sodiums uh, for two potassiums. This is the primary active transporter. I should probably write that on the board somewhere. Well, it's right there. Primary active transport. The sodium potassium ATPase pump. So I've explained it in easy to follow steps. Hopefully you can follow that. So what you've accomplished is um, By this pump, always pumping, you're always keeping sodium on the outside of the cell, and you're always keeping potassium on the inside of the cell. You're always maintaining these ionic gradients. So sodium is always high on the outside, and potassium is always high on the inside. Okay, so let me write that down. This pumping <coughs> maintains 
ionic gradients. So, so that sodium sodium I'll put my concentration brackets around the sodium. So the sodium concentration is high extracellularly extra cellularly and that um, potassium is high intracellularly That's very important. Okay, now, what I didn't tell you is, I mean, no one's asking, and maybe you don't. The thing about cells is um, there's these things called like leak channels. That's important in some cells when we talk about this pump. For example, let, let me draw a leak channel uh, right here. It's a channel that's in the cell membrane. Leak. We call them leak channels. This one's particularly just for potassium. Things will just leak in or leak out depending on the concentration gradient. And let me draw one for uh, sodium too, because there is one for sodium. There's, there's actually more for potassium, but I'm just trying to teach the basic concept here. There's a leak channel. Well, I drew it red, so what is it for? Let's see if you're with me here. Sodium. Okay. Now let's ignore our pump for the time being, even though I just taught you how it works. A leak channel will allow molecules to diffuse down their concentration gradient. So, which way will sodium leak? Will sodium leak into the cell, or will sodium leak out, just following regular diffusion? It will leak in. Sodium leak in. It's following its concentration gradient. Cells are permeable to sodium, and because sodium is usually higher in the ECF outside the cell, out here, ECF as opposed to ICF. I guess the bottom of the board is inside the cell, and sodium always leaks in because it's following its concentration gradient. Is what's it going to do for potassium leak channels? Leak in or leak out? If there's more in, it'll leak out. I'll draw a couple balls leaking out here. Get a better green ball. Potassium leaks out. So stop and think for a minute. I mean, if um, well, that's true, ignore the pump. If it's one's going to leak in and one's going to leak out, aren't the concentration gradients eventually just going to go away and dissipate? Yeah, pretty much. Um, and we don't want that. We want um, cells to maintain these ionic gradients because they're very useful for the secondary active transporters. So we need these pumps to expend their valuable energy to maintain the ionic gradients to counteract these passive forces of leak. So let me write that down. Okay. Um, so um, with Sodium and potassium leak channels 
those channels, if we just allow things to flow down the concentration gradients, they would um, destroy the ionic gradients of sodium and potassium. Sodium and potassium lead channels would destroy the sodium and potassium concentration gradients. So we go back to the pump. That's why we got the pump. The pumping of the primary active transporter, it counteracts the passive forces of leak. pumping of the primary active transporter counteracts the passive forces of leak. Again, they're, therefore, uh, thereby maintaining the ionic gradients. I'll put that as the last thought, OK? Uh, thereby maintaining ionic gradients of sodium and potassium. So the last thing we have to talk about is, great, we have these ionic gradients. What does the cell do with them? So you, you can start to look at pictures that, that show you. Here's a picture showing, on the left, our sodium potassium ATPase pump right there, just doing the pumping, right? That's the primary guy, the primary active transporter pumping. I'll pump three sodium out um, and get three, sorry, two potassium in. Now they show it right next to a secondary active transporter. The secondary active transporters, they utilize the concentration gradient established by the primary one. So that was the whole point okay, of learning how this works. It establishes the gradient that the secondary active transporter uses. So I guess I better draw one on the board somewhere. <coughs> so let me draw just another molecule right next to it. Um, let's see. Make that the secondary active transporter. This one's the primary. This was the secondary. So I'll write what I say there. The secondary active transporter utilizes the concentration gradient established by the primary one. That, that's the key point here. Secondary active transporters utilize concentration gradients established by the primary active transporters like the sodium potassium ATP pump. So the example, um, what they show is, they show a secondary active transporter binding sodium and glucose, and they're, they're being co-transported into the cell at the same time. So what 
let's say on the inside of the cell, there's a bunch of glucose because cells use glucose. They store it and they use it for energy. There's glucose. Yummy, yummy. The cells need the glucose. And you already have a bunch inside the cell. But you want to bring more in. I mean, you need a lot of glucose. So here's glucose out here. Somehow, you're going to have to get it inside the cell against its concentration gradient. What the secondary act active transporters do is they take advantage of the concentration gradient of sodium, and they just use that natural energy, and they're able to bring in both the sodium, one, two, three, with a glucose, kind of at the same time, and it's called co-transport. So you've co-transported three sodiums and a glucose at the same time. Let me write the word co-transport on the board. Because this secondary active transporter, as an example, is acting as a co-transporter. The primary had to burn ATP to accomplish its job, but the secondary have to burn ATP. Yeah, yes or no? The answer is no. Where did the energy come from? It came from the, the sodium following its natural concentration gradient, and it used that energy to bring something else into the cell against its concentration gradient, and no ATP was required. Okay, so that, that's kind of the, the effect of primary one. Is, is there any questions on how the primary and secondary depend on each other? Again, this, the glucose is the desired thing. The cell has to bring glucose into the cell. So if you just establish these gradients by the primary one, the secondary one just uses it. Okay, And um, both are brought in. So it's like you bring them in, and then what do you do? The pump pumps them right back out. You bring it in, and just pump it right back out, and you maintain these gradients. Okay? And every time you pump it right back out and bring it back in, take in what you want. It could be something else. It could be a vitamin. It could be something else the cell, the cell finds desirable. You don't want to like always have to depend on some kind of concentration gradient. You just want some kind of energy source to always bring it in. Okay? Okay, well, um, here's a picture from the book, and it, it's straight from your textbook, and sometimes students struggle with this one, like if I were to show you this on a test or something, and um, they show you the primary active transporter and the secondary active transporter. Like, for example, check for your understanding. Let me go through these with you, and later on, maybe just as a note to yourself, tomorrow, look at this, and see if you can answer those questions. Oh yeah, that's easy. Sometimes students mess up on this. So let's go through it now. Um, which is the primary active transporter in this picture? This molecule A, this is the same molecule, B. Which one's primary, A or B? I would say A is, and they're trying to show you that the B was the secondary active transporter. Okay, then I use the words co-transporter and counter-transporter. I didn't define counter-transport. I did define co-transport. Let me go back over here. Co-transport, I brought two molecules into the cell, and they both were transported in the same direction, both in. In this molecule, while you bought two in, you ejected three out. That would be counter transport, because you're transporting two molecules in opposite directions. Okay? So that having been said, what is A, co or counter? K. 
counter. The B is the cone. You're, you're bringing the uh, two different molecules in the same direction. And the last question asks, well, what is being co-transported? What is being counter-transported? Well, here, it was sodium and potassium were being exchanged. Here, the two items being co-transported, and in our example, there are others. It was sodium, and what were these supposed to be? As I talked about it, glucose. Yeah, so that, that's not too hard if you just kind of figure out what all the symbols mean. Now, what I want to really get to um, in preparation for Wednesday's lab is osmosis. And what I did was um, I talked with the lab tech, and I realized how she prepped it, and I had to make modifications to the lab. Um, I didn't have time to um, put it on canvas yet, I will. But I did make hard copies for you this morning. So uh, before you leave, maybe like when we take our break in a little bit, you can grab one uh, for yourself. But this is for Wednesday. And for today, for our lab, we're doing a microscope lab. And I'd ask you to print that out. And if some of you forgot, I, I did make a few copies for what I'm hoping is just a few of you who forgot and you can have one. And um, but anyways, let me teach osmosis first. I gotta got a little bit of time before I take a break. Let's see here. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. It's simply um, well I always remember this from my biology class in college for professor was like the golden rule of biology is water goes to where the most stuff is. And that's shown in this picture here. Where you have um, solutions, or just water in the solution of sucrose here, divided by a permeable membrane. And it looks like in this um, example, the water molecules can freely pass back and forth, but the sucrose molecules cannot. Okay, And that this big arrow is pointing this in this direction because water, in an effort to dilute out, um, the sucrose solution, it goes to where the most stuff is. Okay, that, that's a very simple way to put it. It's the second law of thermodynamics that you learned about in chemistry, which is essentially, in the universe, things go from order to disorder. Even I still remember that from chemistry. What it means is, I've thought about that over the years, is nature doesn't like things that are ordered and neat. For example, if you have these two compartments, this is water, this is sucrose pollutions, solution, that's order. Nature doesn't like that. It always wants to go from order to disorder. So in an effort to dilute it out, <laughs> water will go to where the most stuff is. That's the diffusion of water. Always think of that. We learn about it because water diffuses in and out of your cells, so you have to understand the solution that the cells are in. So osmosis across the cell membrane can cause the cell to shrink or swell. It depends on that OSM is osmolarity. Let me write that down. See that a lot in this class. OSM equals osmolarity. And you know what molarity is in chemistry. It was moles per liter. It, it's a unit of concentration. So osmolarity is biological molarity osmolarity, osmosis, you know, make the connection. That's kind of why the two terms are used together. Osmolarity will affect osmosis. Um, so you got to think about the osmolarity of the, the fluid inside the cell and the osmolarity of the fluid outside the cell, what the solution is in. Th this picture, it, it's pretty easy to understand what's going on here. Like, for example, well, let's pretend you have a um, beaker of solution. I guess it will be your bloodstream, but just for simplicity's sake, um, let's pretend there's a fluid in there. You know, let's pretend you got drop a cell in there, or just a regular round cell. And let's assume all units are osmolarity of something, some kind of concentration. Let's say the inside of the cell, just use a simple number, I don't know, 10. That's the uh, concentration of the intracellular fluid of the red blood cell. And let, let's say that the osmolarity of the salt solution you have is also 10. Let, let's just make it the same.
if it's the same, there is fluid moving in and out of the cell pretty much at the same rate though. There's no net fluid in or out. So as much water that flows into the cell will flow out of the cell. So in this condition, there's no net fluid movement. No net fluid movement. Because the conditions are the same. The solution is 10. But so it, it's the same thing for the ICF. It, it's also 10. So there's no net movement. And we call that condition the solution is isotonic to the cell. Okay, so the solution is isotonic. Iso means same. Iso. Keyword being iso. Iso means same. Let's see here. Okay, well then you got the uh, the middle thing there. It looks like the, the cell is shrinking. So for the cell to shrivel up, let's say it was still 10, but it, it, it lost water, it shrank. There's a net movement of fluid out of the cell. For that to happen, to shrivel up your cells, the solution must have been more salty. So maybe uh, the solution was like 15. Okay, and we call that hypertonic. Hyper means more. So, net fluid out. Cell shrank. Okay, that's a hypertonic condition. The solution is hypertonic okay, to the cell. The cell shrank. And then the last one, the cell swells. about to burst because there's a net fluid in net fluid in I mean to start with it was always 10 right but net fluid moved in to try to dilute that 10 because it's like water goes to where the most stuff is so what was the solutions concentration well less than 10 let's say it was 5 just for simplicity's sake. Keep the numbers right, nice and simple. So this is a hypotonic solution. Right? Net fluids in, cell swells. It may burst, it may not. But um, well, they don't show it bursting there, so I won't show it bursting. Wait, wait, this whole thing, this iso-hyper, hypotonic, they call that tonicity. Um, it's the ability, ability of a solution to affect cell volume. I'm going to write that on the board. Tonicity. The ability solution with that cell volume. If it's isotonic, it won't, but if it's hyper hypo, it will. Okay, that's the, that's the thing to take away there.
So I got a picture of the same thing there. Um, tonicity, the ability of a solution to alter the water volume of the cell, the tone of the cell. Well, which condition is the solution hypertonic? Hypertonic. Let's see, what do we do? If it's hypertonic, the cell would shrink. So where they're showing that is the cell shrink. What net fluid left the cell? Which one's ISO, A, B, or C? A. Yeah, A, that's yeah, pretty easy once you get it. And we're going to do this in lab. It's like, but in, on Wednesday, instead of real cells, well, we'll have some dialysis, dialysis tubing. And we'll use different solutions. We'll have a glucose solution. We'll use albumin. we use starch. we use different things. So the inside of the bag is concentrated. And maybe your bag will gain weight. Well, we're going to do it also like... We can see a weight gain, not a weight loss. That's kind of how we're going to do it, because we're just going to drop it in water. Okay, so water is um, a lower concentration than anything you put in your bag. But anyways, that's Wednesday's lab. We'll talk about that then. But the other topic that this brings up, if cell volume is changing, you have to think about osmotic and hydrostatic pressure. Okay. Okay, let me um, go back to this. Uh, let, let me tackle this when we come back after break. Come back in 15 minutes. I'll let you just a little bit and then we'll go right into the lab. Okay. If you uh, needed a copy of today's lab, go right up here.